Аллах и Алхамдулиллах, Усалат, Усалам, Аллах, Расулиллах, Аллах, 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 and the virtue of that Prophet and some evidence pertaining to his prophethood. And this is all more important in light of course of the, what seemingly is a repeated attacks against the Prophet wasallam that not only come from the West but they come from East and West. And Unfortunately, that these attacks, they do find an audience. And they find an audience because a lot of people don't know about the Prophet ﷺ. And so they are primed to believe the worst. Especially because of the image that they have about Muslims. That is, because of the negative image that they have about Muslims, if someone attacks the Prophet ﷺ and so, sort of links what is at fault with Muslims, with the Prophet, they tend to believe it. And so our job becomes then is to understand our Prophet better, talk about him, defend him, and especially revisit why was he so special, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and why was he a Prophet of Allah? Like how do we know that he's a Prophet of Allah? Not that we have doubts, alhamdulillah, but that the more that you know, the more that you'll be able to defend and the more that you'll be able to believe. Because greater evidence brings greater belief, greater certainty. So Allah Azza wa Jal, let's begin with an ayah in the Quran where Allah Azza wa Jal says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ Allah had did a great favor. So Allah did a great favor to the believers when he had sent to them a messenger from among themselves. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He recites to them the verses of Allah, the ayahs of Allah. And he purifies the believers. And he teaches them al-kitab, the book, and the hikmah, wisdom. That is the sunnah. وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلِ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ even though before that they were in clear manifest error. So this ayah is an important ayah to understand because Allah has counted sending Muhammad as a favor. Right? That is, do you believe that Muhammad وسلم, coming to you, and he did not come to you directly but indirectly, right? Through the messengers of the messenger of the Prophet وسلم, right? So do you count that as a favor? Because Allah counts it as a favor upon you. So if you think about what are the favors of Allah upon you, if you think about it, you'll count your health, right? You may count your family. You may count your job. You may count the money that you have. But you have counted Islam as a favor. And have you ever counted Muhammad وسلم, in particular as a favor? That is, it's the greatest favor that Allah had sent you a prophet. And if you want to think about it, and the more that you think about it, the more that you actually believe that I have been really blessed with the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So let's take just a few random examples. Suppose before you were to ever take any drop of alcohol into your body and become addicted to it, and become an alcoholic. And before a person, because of drunken driving, kills somebody, or their family member gets killed, before you become so sick because of alcohol that you die, before your marriage falls apart because of your addiction to alcohol, before all of that, if someone were to come to you and tell you, do not drink, and save you from all of that trouble, would you not count that as a favor? Like if you just could go back in time and say, if someone could just come to me and tell me, 
don't drink, it will destroy your life. Would you not count that as a favor? If someone, there's a problem between you and your spouse, someone could come to you, talk to you and her for 30 minutes and solve it. And before that, you're heading towards divorce. Would you not count that as a favor? Would you not kiss that person's hand and say, thank you, you've saved my marriage and you saved my children, right? If somebody could uh, save you from gambling, if somebody could teach you how to raise your kids so that they are good kids, tell you what to do and what not to do. If someone could teach you what to do when you feel down, like where do I go when I feel really down and depressed? What do I say? What do I do? And if I want something in this life, how do I know if it's good or bad for me? How do I choose? And somebody tells and tells you, you don't need to read horoscopes and you don't need to consult psychics because they know nothing. But I'll give you something to do. You call on Allah in this particular way and Allah guides you. The Creator guides you. And so when you do what He tells you, you find that certainly certain things start revealing themselves. The good presents itself to you, and evil runs away from you. Would you not consult, consider that to be a favor? Right? Like each one of these things is a jewel that is presented to you. And add to all of this that if someone were to teach you how to escape hellfire, and how in detail how you can get into Jannah, and if you make a mistake, how that could be forgiven, isn't that a great knowledge? So who gave you all of this? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Right? So everything good that we know comes through him sallallahu alayhi wa So it is actually the greatest ni'mah, the greatest favor, because that ni'mah is the ni'mah of Islam. And it comes through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's why Allah says that is counted as a favor. And if you think about it, you have to ask, thank Allah for it. As you, when you wake up in the morning and you say, Alhamdulillah, that I'm healthy, you look at your family and you thank Allah for it, you get promoted, or you have a bonus and you thank Allah for it, the fact that you are a Muslim who still believes, who still practices, who loves Allah, that is a greater favor than all of the worldly favors combined. And so Allah Azza wa Jal says, he, he says that this Prophet comes from you from among you. And if you think about it, that in itself is one of the proofs that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a prophet of Allah. Because he is not a stranger. When he comes from Quraysh, Quraysh knew him very well, right? Quraysh knew about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very well because if you are a stranger coming to a strange people, you could have hid your past. And you could have said anything about your past. You could have hid the fact that you've been training for this mission of claiming to be a prophet. And you were learning. And now you pretend that this is all from Allah. But Muhammad wasallam was an open book. Because they know exactly where he comes from, who his parents are, who took care of him, how he spent his time, to whom he got married. He, they know everything about him. So to come out of that, all of a sudden and say, I'm a prophet, and say to them things that he could not have learned from anybody else. Right? Because to learn these things, especially from someone who was an ummi, an illiterate, would be impossible. If he were to sit to learn it from someone, they would know. Who has this knowledge in Mecca? No one has this knowledge in Mecca. Right? You would have to go to the people of the book. And the people of the book were not in Mecca. And no one was residing there who would teach Muhammad وسلم, all of that. In addition to it, that Muhammad وسلم, would know things that the people of the book do not know. That's why, you know, one of the times, you know, when uh, the Meccans wanted to uh, kind of trap the Prophet وسلم, they would go to the people of the book in Medina. He said, tell us things we can ask him. So they say, ask him about the people of the cave, okay? The people who had slept for a long time and woke up and tell him about a per ask him about a person who had um, kingship 
in the east and the west, Dhul Qarnayn, and ask him, because they said, no one knows about these things unless he's a prophet. Like, we have this knowledge, but are they sharing it? Do they share it? No, it's hidden. It's absolutely hidden, right? So that's why also Abdullah ibn Salam, radiallahu anhu, he was a Jewish rabbi. So when he, when the Prophet ﷺ went with Abdullah ibn Salam to the other Jewish rabbi, and Abdullah had accepted Islam, and the Prophet ﷺ said, read the Torah. Read the Torah. What does it say about this and that? So they said, okay, and they sat, and they were reading the Torah. Because we were saying this, 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 this. Abdullah ibn Salam is saying, oh, Prophet of Allah, that's not what it says. Okay? Let them like remove their hand and read the rest of it. So when they read the rest of it, it confirmed what the Prophet ﷺ was saying. So they would hide this knowledge. This is not a knowledge that they would share with people. So the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was illiterate, and they, he knew about all of these things, the story of Musa, and in detail, the story of Isa, and in detail. And typically also, if you believed, or if, if hypothetically, the people of the book were the teachers of Muhammad وسلم, they would represent to him an authority, right? Like I, I'm learning from them. I would not contradict them because they're my teachers. And they typically would know, I mean, as a student, your teacher would know more than you. Would you dare to contradict your teacher and say, the things you told me, they were wrong and here's what's right? Typically you don't do that, especially when that teacher is gonna withhold knowledge from you and he knows more than you. Muhammad وسلم, would correct what they believe about Musa, would correct what they uh, believe about Isa السلام, They would correct what they believe about Ibrahim and Dawood and Sul and all of those things and would share with them details that they have lost or they would oppose and would stand up to them and say, this is what is right and what you're saying is wrong. And you don't do that with someone who had taught you because if someone had taught you this, what do they do? they can easily expose you. Oh, what, you're contradicting me? You think you know better? Remember when I taught you all of these things? But that never happened, right? So, he was an open book, as we said. Min anfusikum, you know him very well. And then, he's teaching you, right? What is Prophet Muhammad وسلم, teaching? That's another sign of his prophethood. What is he teaching? If a person is allied with the shaitan, meaning he's a liar, what would a person who is allied with the shaitan teach? Versus someone who's speaking on, Allah, on behalf of Allah teach. So if someone is an ally of the devil, would he promote honesty? Would he tell you stop, stop sinning? Would he tell you, listen to your parents and honor them? Would he tell you, take care of your wife and your children? Would he, would he tell you, um, be gentle with the weak in society? Would he promote righteousness if someone is allied with the shaitan? If he was lying? But what does Muhammad وسلم, teach? It's the opposite. And I will focus on what he taught. But before I forget, I want to focus on his character because that tells you a lot about him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when Muhammad وسلم, receives his first revelation from Jibreel, and you know the story, and he comes back to Khadija, and the Prophet وسلم, is trembling. Now why was he trembling? Why was he trembling? Because of that? Because of the wahi that he received, because he saw what he did not expect. It is so magnificent and so big that he started trembling. And that tells you that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wasn't sitting expecting it. He wasn't someone who's waiting, I'm waiting for the angel to come. Because if that's the case, he'd come back home happy. I finally received it. I was waiting for it for six months, a year, and finally I get the call. He wasn't sitting, waiting to be a prophet. No. So that's why when he receives the angel talking to him, it's, it's an out-of-this-world uh, out experience. He comes back to Khadija, 
and he's trembling. And he says, I am afraid for myself. What did I see? What is this that is happening to me? Now, the statement of Khadija is important here. He said, Abshir fa wallahi la yukhzik Allahu abada. He says, expect the best, for indeed Allah will not abandon you or disgrace you. Innaka la tasilur rahim. Wa tasduq al hadith, wa tukrid al daif, wa tahmil al kal, wa tu'inu ala nawaib al haq. He says, expect the best because you are kind to your relatives and you always speak the truth and you honor the guest when you host them and you help people with adversity and if someone is in trouble you assist them and you take care of them he said you do all of this so Allah will not abandon you now Khadija understood something very important about Allah Azza wa when she spoke what did she understand about Allah? That when you behave like that, what does Allah do to you? He honors you. Right? That if you're good to people, and the Prophet ﷺ later would affirm this understanding in many a hadith. Irhamu man fil ard, yarhamkum man fil sama. Be merciful with people on earth, the merciful will be merciful with you. That is, as you treat people, Allah will be to you. Does that make sense to you? So she is saying, this is how you are. And if this is how you are to people, would Allah Azza wa Jal send any harm or allow any harm to come your way or disgrace you? This is impossible. Because the habit has been that if someone is good, Allah is good to them. You don't have to even be a Muslim to realize that. You just have to believe in a higher power that is wise. And if you believe in that, you know that if you live a good life and you're good to people, God will be good to you. That makes sense. That's what Khadija radiallahu anha was saying. This is how you are. Now, at that point, right, the way that the Prophet وسلم, behaved and how she, she described, did he behave like that because he was a prophet? No. Did he behave like that because Allah told him specifically to behave like that? No. He was like that. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he naturally was like that. He liked to help. He loved to help. He loved to assist. He was very generous. He was very patient. If he finds someone who's in need, he will rush to help him. That's his nature. This is how he was. This is before Islam. So what do you think about what happened to him after Islam? What happened to his character after Islam? Perfection then. So you may think that's easy, right? But to always speak the truth and never lie until you are known as Al-Ameen. Is that easy? Now we're Muslims today. And it's always good to hold these comparisons because you understand. We're Muslims today. Can you genuinely say that people around you will say you are Always a speaker of the truth? No. But we're Muslim. Yet Muhammad Sallallahu wasn't then, but he would never lie. His nature. Could people say about you, about me, right? That whenever you find someone in need of help, you will go and help them even at your own expense? No. So what made Muhammad Sallallahu behave in such a way? And what, did he, was, what was he getting out of it? Is his nature. He wanted to help. He loved to help. And so after Islam, that only was magnified. Because Allah Azza wa Jal commanded it. Allah Azza wa Jal purified him. Allah elevated him. And so when Allah says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Indeed, you possess great character, great manners. Allah Azza wa Jal is making that testimony because this is how he is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He has the best of character. So that character again is a reflection of prophethood and the choice of prophethood. Because if someone is lying about Allah Azza wa Jal, he wouldn't be that type of person. If someone is lying about Allah, he wouldn't be the type of person who is uh, selfless, generous, honest all the time. Someone who's lying about Allah, claiming to himself things that are not his, lying about 
communication from God, lying about, you know, what God wants him to do, assuming power to himself, he wouldn't be a selfless person. He'd be completely opposite. A selfish, dishonest, self-serving uh, charlatan who's always after money, who's always... But that wasn't Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So the question here is, what is it that he got from the message of Islam, if we were to believe that Muhammad Sallallahu wasn't saying the truth, what did he get out of it? So think about it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, once he announced that he is a prophet of Allah, a messenger of Allah, and told Quraysh about it, that brought on him the enmity of all of Quraysh. And he was alone, right? He had few followers in the beginning, but, but most were hiding their Islam. Who was standing? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam alone. And it's interesting, subhanAllah, there is a hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was saying, that is saying that Allah Azza wa Jal told me that I'm gonna give you a book that no water can wash away. That's the Quran, right? And now why is it that no water can wash it away? Because Muslims memorize it. And nothing can take Quran away because Muslims memorize it. And go to Quraysh and tell them about this message. So the Prophet ﷺ says, إِذَنْ يَثْلَغُ رَأْسِي وَيَدْعَوهُ خُبْزَ He says, if I go to Quraysh, they'll break my head like a piece of bread. Right? If you know like um, crispy bread and you break it, cracks so that's exactly what he says is if i go to them and tell them all of these things and i'm alone what will they do they'll break my head like a piece of bread snap he says no go and um, fight them and we'll send an army with you meaning the army of angels send and go with them with an army and we'll send an army with you double triple five times the number of what you will send and uh, combat them and we will assist you meaning that they will not win against you go and that is like the statement that was given to Musa alayhi salam when Musa and Harun and Musa had Harun by the way right Musa had Harun and he requested Harun it says Ushdud bihi azri. help me with Harun make me stronger with Harun so he went with Harun and even this qala rabbana inna na khafu he says, Ya Allah, we're afraid of Pharaoh, right? He will kill us. He says, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm listening and I can see. Don't go. I mean, don't be afraid. Go and just talk. Deliver the message. And Pharaoh, Fir'aun, couldn't harm them. Subhanallah. And there's great lesson in this, that when Allah Azzawajal asks you to do something, as long as that's what Allah is asking, Allah will take care of you. So when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi he says, well, I'm afraid. He says, no, do it. And he was standing alone, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So what did he get out of this message? What worldly benefit did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi get out of this message if someone were to say he wasn't honest about it? So let's think about it. All of Quraysh stands against him. They attack him personally. You're a liar, you're this, you're, a, you're, a, uh, you're crazy, you're a poet, you're this and you're that. So there's attacks on him personally. There are attacks on his companions later. They get persecuted, they get tortured, they get killed. And the Prophet ﷺ sees that. Then he gets physically attacked. He gets physically attacked in Mecca and he gets physically attacked in Medina, right? And then, I'm sorry. Masamid. But Taif, yes, and it Taif. So he gets physically attacked. And there are attempts on his life to assassinate him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, multiple ones. So he's in danger. Family members get of him, of his, get killed. In Mecca, right, when he migrates, all the property that he has, he loses. Nothing of his remains. Goes to Medina to a new place. People start fighting him. Quraysh fights, then they collect the rest of the Arab tribes and they try to lay siege to Medina. 
And the Muslims, they go hungry, and he could see this. And he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was in Medina, he says, لَقَدْ أُخِفْتُ فِي اللَّهِ وَمَا يَخَافُ أَحَدٍ he says, I was frightened, terrorized for the sake of Allah and no one else was. Meaning I stood alone and they terrorized me and they frightened me and no one else was with me. And I remember the days when for three days the only thing that I could eat is whatever Bilal could sneak under his or under his arm. For three days, there's nothing I could eat except if Bilal could sneak something to me without someone seeing it. A piece of bread or a piece of that. That's when they laid siege to Banu Hashim. Right? For three years. And for three years he endures. And he insists. And the companions around him, they insist. And they don't give up. What was he getting out of it? What worldly benefit did he get out of any of this? Right? And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, lived. Did he live as a rich man? No, he didn't live as a rich man. Did he die as a rich man? No, he didn't die as a rich man. He wasn't collecting money. And he wasn't collecting glory, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he wasn't collecting money. Whenever he would get money, from zakah, from sadaqat, from this and that, what would he do with it? Distribute it and give it away. The next patch comes, distribute that and give it away to those who need it. Does he keep anything for himself? He doesn't keep anything to himself. And that's why one of the Arab, one of the Bedouins, when he went and asked Muhammad وسلم, he said, I want money, I don't have this and I don't have that. He says, go to that valley. Do you see all those cattle and sheep and what have you in that valley? He says, yes. He says, take all of it. So he took all of it. And we went to his people and he said, oh people, oh my people, my tribe, accept Islam. Muhammad وسلم, gives so much, he's not afraid of being poor. He gives so much, he's not afraid of being poor. Now, there's a difference between how Muhammad وسلم, gave and how a king gives. If you go to a king and you ask him for money, and let's say that king is rich. Obviously, kings are rich, right? He, you ask him for money. He gives you money. But does he give you most of what he has? Half of it? Not even 10% or 5% of it. He'll give you some, but most of it stays with him, right? That's how he remains a king. For Muhammad وسلم, how much does he give? He gives out all. Like he doesn't have anything back. He doesn't give anything back. That's why that Arabi, when he saw this, he says, what type of giving is this? Like, is he not afraid that he will not have enough to eat tomorrow? He's not afraid of being poor. Imagine that type of giving. Like, if somebody comes to you, and this again, again, I'm saying those comparisons are useful. Because we hear those stories about the Prophet ﷺ, but we don't relate that to our lives. So imagine somebody comes and asks you for money. You go, you look at your bank account, you write everything in it, and you give them a check and you say, take everything. Will you ever do that? Tomorrow is for tomorrow, right? Tomorrow is for tomorrow. You will never do this. Because you, you know what your family will do to you if you do this? And you know what you will do to yourself afterwards if you say, well, was I crazy? Why did I give everything to that person? I have expenses, I have debts, I have this. Where will money come from? You see, you'll start blaming yourself. Well, how will I eat tomorrow? But Muhammad Sallallahu wasn't like that, so he gives it all. And then the next day he would go to Aisha or to Hafsa and he say, do you have food? They say, no. They say, I'm fasting. Nothing, no food. And when it comes time for breaking his fast, what does he eat? What do you have at home? Dates. So he just eats those dates. And so Aisha says, we would spend a month, we would spend two months, where there was no cooking in our homes. Not, we're cooking nothing at home. So he asks her, I mean, uh, the, her nephew asks her, what is it that you've lived on if you cook nothing at home? She said, dates and water. Dates and water for two months. So he didn't save any money for himself. Dates and water, okay. Can you live on 
Let's not say dates. Can you just eat eggs for two months? No meat, right? No chicken, nothing like that. Just eggs. One meal a day. Couple of eggs and that's it. For a month, can you do that? Or for two months, can you do this? No. Yet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, with, with this, he would never say no. If you ask him for something, he would never say no to you. He would give it to you. So where did that generosity come if a person is looking for glory? I saw another incident is that somebody gifted the Prophet Sallallahu a new attire, a thobe, and looked nice. So one of the Sahaba, when he saw the Prophet Sallallahu wearing that, he said, Oh Prophet of Allah, this is beautiful. Right? Can I have it? So the Prophet ﷺ said yes. And then he just finished the business that he was doing and then went inside the house and came back with that thobe folded. right? And he gave it to him. And he wore whatever old stuff he had at home. So the other sahaba, they said, you know, he couldn't find anyone to ask except the Prophet ﷺ who just got that new piece now. Somebody gifted it to him. He said, I didn't want to get it because I admired it. I wanted it because it touched the body of the Prophet وسلم, I'll use this as my kafan, my shroud. So when I die, I want to be wrapped in this. That's why he asked for it. But again here, the Prophet وسلم, didn't say no to him. And if you and I right, got something new out of so many weeks and years of not having it, and somebody asks for it, what do you say? Hey, forget about you, what? I just got this. Let me enjoy it a little bit. Go ask somebody else. But he never says no, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because the dunya did not matter to him. And so he didn't collect money. He was in need. His family was in need. His daughter, uh, Fatima, radiyallahu anha. And Fatima, you know, you know in terms of... Uh, tribal honor, if you think about tribal honor and prestige and status, Fatima is the daughter of Muhammad Sallallahu And she's from Banu Hashim. So she's a very honorable person in terms of lineage, in addition to her Islam or what have you. So Fatima comes to the Prophet Sallallahu and she says, housework is so hard for me, right? That it had left marks on my hand. Because housework for them wasn't like housework for us today. You'd have to go fetch water. You have to carry the buckets. You have to bring it out of the well. It will leave your hands bleeding maybe or, or blistered. It's not an easy thing. So she asks the Prophet ﷺ because she had heard that he had received some people and one of them could serve as a servant. So she said to Ali, Anhu, go ask the Prophet ﷺ, maybe he can give us someone who could help us, domestic help. And so the Prophet ﷺ comes and he says, I know about what you requested. Shall I tell you about something that is better to you than a servant? Before you go to bed, you say what? Subhanallah 33 times, 33 times, Alhamdulillah 33 times, uh, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha Allah, Wallahu Akbar. Right? Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wallahu akbar. Okay, 34 times. He said, you say that, that's better to you than a khadim, than a servant. And he didn't give her anything. When he dies, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? And one of the things that, if you're working for yourself, you want to make sure that your family after you is well taken care of, right? Sah wa la? Am I right? So, okay, I'm saving money from my family. Make sure that they inherit. Make sure that they have a house. Make sure that they have this and that so that I know that if I die, they'll be okay. Okay. So for the Prophet ﷺ, did the family after him inherit anything from him? No. Because he said Sallallahu <laughs> We... Prophets, we don't bequeath anything after our death. We don't leave anything for inheritance. So the family of the Prophet ﷺ doesn't get anything from him. And even Fatima radiallahu anha, which she did not know about the hadith, she said to Abu Bakr, she said, how is it that everybody inherits from his father, but I'm not inheriting from my father? 
He said because he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that no family member inherits from the prophets of Allah. Any prophet. Whatever they leave behind, people don't inherit from it. So none of that goes to his family. Is this someone who was working for a family or for herself? Or who was working for an ummah and for Allah Azza wa Jal? Because it doesn't make sense if you were to say that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in it for himself, that he would do this to his family after. Right? Or he would live like that. Or he wouldn't try to attribute as much glory as he can to himself. He doesn't do that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Somebody comes to praise him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he says, Anta Sayyiduna wa ibn Sayyidina. He says, you are our master, son of our master. He says, speak uh, naturally and don't exaggerate. Don't exaggerate in your speech. And he says in a hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't praise me and exaggerate my praise like they did with Isa ibn Maryam, but say the slave of Allah and his messenger. So why, if you have all the power, not attribute glory to yourself? Right? Why not say, you know, I am this and I am that, and, in, and I decide this and I decide that? Why, why say, إِنَّمَا أَنَا قَاسِمٌ وَاللَّهُ يُعْطِي He says, I only divide and Allah is the one who gives. Why not attribute this to yourself and say, I'm giving you money. I'm, I'm deciding what to give you and what not to give you. Why say Allah decides? I'm only following orders from Allah Azza wa Jal. Why not attribute that to yourself? Why say, إِنَّمَا أَنَا عَبْدُ أَجْلِسُ كَمَا يَجْلِسُ الْعَبْدُ وَيَأْكُلُ كَمَا يَأْكُلُ الْعَبْدُ He says, I'm, a, I'm like a slave. I sit like a slave sits and I eat like a slave eats. Why not, be not, why not be like a king? Why not be like a king? And demand respect. Right? When they came to the Prophet وسلم, and they say, O oh, Prophet of Allah in Asham, they prostrate to their priests. Shall we not prostrate to you? Like when we want to greet you. You know how they do with kings and what have you. What do they do? They bow to them. And to some, they actually go, fall on the floor, fall on the ground. So he asks, shall we not do this to you? He says, no. Why not demand more? On a time when there was an eclipse, and it coincided that Ibrahim, the son of Muhammad, alayhi salam, yani the son of the Prophet, salam, Ibrahim just died. And he died when there was an eclipse. People started saying what? The eclipse is because his son died. It's a big thing, right? The eclipse is because his, because his son died. If he wanted glory, he could have just what, said what? Yes. Or at least say nothing. What does he say, sallallahu alayhi wasallam? He say an eclipse does not happen because somebody had lived or died. This is an ayah from Allah azza wa So he removes any exaggeration. Right? No, Ibrahim died, yes, but the eclipse is not related to this at all. And he says about his progeny afterwards, he says, you cannot take any sadaqah. You cannot take sadaqah from people. Again, limiting their financial dependence on people. You cannot take any money from people. So, you think about it, what did he get, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What, what worldly glory did he get from it? If he was to pretending to be a prophet of Allah Azza wa Jal. His, he was attacked as we said. People tried to kill him. Loved ones were killed. And he saw Muslims being uh, persecuted. And he didn't know at that moment would he live to see the success of Islam or not. All that he knew was Allah Azza wa Jal told me to do this and that. And I did it. And something also to think about when thinking about the Prophet Sallallahu and what he said. It says something Allah Azza wa mentioned in the Quran. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى He doesn't speak out of his hawa, out of his desire. What does that mean? It means that whatever he says, he says because Allah tells him. It's wahi. Allah tells him exactly to say this. And again, it goes back to the issue of why not assume that you know? 
Why refer everything back to Allah Azza wa on multiple occasions? So in one hadith, he says that hadith. He says there's that particular hadith. He says there would be a, uh, a member of my ummah. He will intercede for so many people. They will be like the tribe of Rabi'ah and Mudar. So one of the people listening, he says, O Prophet of Allah, isn't Rabi'ah the son of Mudar? Because the statement of the Prophet made Rabi'ah equivalent to Mudar. He says, O Prophet of Allah, isn't Rabi'ah just the son of Mudar? He says, kama uqawwal. He says, I'm saying as I was told to say. Meaning I'm not saying this of my own. I'm saying as I'm told to say. And then the scholars are saying, he says, no, Rabi'ah is as the Prophet وسلم, is saying is the son of Mudar. I mean, is, is the brother of Mudar, not his son, as that man said. But the response of the Prophet was, I say as I'm being told to say. Some, at, some, at one point, they asked the Prophet وسلم, something. He says, I do not know until I ask Jibreel. And then he asked and he said, he said this. Or in another occasion, he says, gives the answer, and he says, I did not know this until Jibreel told me. Right? This tells you that when the Prophet ﷺ spoke, he wouldn't say anything unless it's from Allah Azza wa Otherwise, he just doesn't venture a guess, doesn't speculate. And again, if you know, if you want to know how hard that is, just ask yourself. How many times have we speculated on things Islamic? When somebody asks us, what do you think this is halal or haram? How many times do we speculate and say, I think it's halal, I think it's haram, I think it should be this. That we, how many times did we speak without having firm knowledge? Right? But we did. But Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never did. I just want you to understand how difficult that is. And it's not easy. Especially when people come seeking answers from you. And to, to say, I don't know. And what will they say? think of me when I say, I don't know? You understand the pressure of just saying, I don't know? Like, like I have no answer. To be humble enough, but pious enough to say, until Allah tells me, I have no clue what that means. Whereas for a lot of us, I'll tell you. Anything you want to know. I'll give you a fatwa and anything you want to know. Just to hold back is difficult. So when Allah says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى He doesn't speak of his own desire. He's praising Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He doesn't add anything. If the Qur'an, exactly the Qur'an. If it's the sunnah, it's exactly the sunnah. Nothing that he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes from him. That's why you can trust him. That's why there was a sahabi, a sahabi who was writing. What the Prophet ﷺ is saying. Then some of the Sahaba or some of the people of Quraysh, they come and they say, listen, you're documenting everything that the Prophet is saying and he's a human being. He sometimes could be angry, he sometimes could do this or could do that. Yeah. Why do you write everything that he's saying? So he asked the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet says, he says, write, by Allah, everything that I'm saying is true. Everything that I'm saying is true. So that means that he doesn't speak out of order. He doesn't speak without knowledge. Sallallahu alayhi wa That's why he could be trusted. Now, look at now at the message. We said we're going to focus on the message. To understand, is this from Allah? Or is it from someone else? So... You look at the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and was it, what is it that he's asking people to do? He tells them be humble and don't be arrogant and take care of the weak in society, the orphan, those who have no one to defend, right? the orphan and the widows uh, and the poor. You take care of them and you honor your parents and you listen to them. As long as what they're saying is pleasing to Allah and is not upsetting to Allah. You listen to them. And you take care of your wife. And a time where they didn't really do that. And the Prophet ﷺ, right? He said, the best of you is the best to his wife. And I am the best to my wife. At a time when they did not give much weight to them. So again, why? 
Why, why champion the weak? For what? Right? What do you get from it? So take care of your kids. And this is how you raise them. And especially daughters. Especially daughters. Not only don't uh, bury them. But no, but if you take care of three daughters or two daughters or three sisters or two sisters, if you take care of them financially and you uh, protect them, that will shield you from Jahannam and get, get you into Jannah. And when you get money, there is a portion of it, zakah, that goes to the poor. You're responsible for them. And sadaqah erases your sins and takes you to Jannah. And he tells them about Hajj, and tells them about Umrah, and tells them about Salah, and tells them about Dua, and most importantly, tells them about Allah Azza wa and who Allah is, and that Allah is forgiving, and just, and wise, and that Allah is perfect and complete. And he tells them about Allah in ways that is not available to the people of the book. For the people of the book, Allah is imperfect. He could, he could, get, he could be regretful, right? He could create and be no wisdom in his creation. He could create and not forgive. Or his anger could precede his forgiveness. But for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's saying that Allah is most merciful and his mercy precedes his anger. And in fact, it's out of the mercy of Allah azza wa jal that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the merciful prophet. Like the final prophet of Allah, the one who has the final message was not a vengeful prophet, was not a harsh prophet, was what? A merciful prophet. And was a prophet who was looking after the ummah, worried about the ummah. So much so that he said, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he says, every prophet had an accepted dua. Like one guaranteed accepted dua, and I've saved mine as an intercession for my ummah on the day of judgment. It means that Every other prophet used his du'a, right? And again, relate this to yourself. If Allah were to give you one time where you could ask him anything and that guaranteed, the acceptance is guaranteed, would you have used it or not? Yes or no? Absolutely. Not only once, how many times would you have used it if you had the opportunity? 10 times, 20, every time you find yourself in trouble, you'll say, I'll use this one for now, right? And if not, the next time you find yourself, okay, I'll use it now. I'll use, I mean, if we had it, not only one, if we had 20, 30, we would be done with them. Because every time we're in trouble, we'd use it. And the prophets of Allah, who are the most patient of all the prophets, each one of them used his. And this is, does not diminish them. I mean, there were reasons why they used them. But the excellence of Muhammad وسلم, is that despite everything he went through, he kept it. He didn't use it. He didn't use it. He didn't use it. Why was he, why was he keeping it? It says, in a time when we really need it. And not for himself. I said, I'm going to give it to my ummah. So I'll intercede on their behalf. And again, if you want to know the favor of Muhammad وسلم, that not only will you witness, but the rest of humanity will witness, is that on the day of judgment, People will be waiting for Allah to come and judge. Standing. Nobody's sitting, right? Standing in the heat. And Allah doesn't come to judge. And Allah doesn't come to judge. And Allah doesn't come. And it's a very long time. And it's an ordeal to wait in that heat. And so what people, and you know the hadith, people will gather and they say, we need to ask someone to intercede so that Allah who is really angry on that day would come and judge between people so that this day could end. Who should we ask? And they go to, you know, they go to Adam, they go to Nuh, they go to Ibrahim, they go to Musa, they go to Isa. Who's the only one who intercedes? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's when he, all of humanity sees the virtue of Muhammad ﷺ because that's when Allah comes to judge. Otherwise, he's not coming. He's so angry with people, he's not coming to judge between them until Muhammad asks him. And then Allah Azzawajal comes and he starts, right? You know, questioning and judging and sending people to Jannah, sending people to Jahannam and so on. And in addition to other intercessions, the intercession of opening Jannah, who is the first person who knocks on the door of Jannah? 
That's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the gatekeeper of Jannah, he says, who's this? He tells him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, I was asked, commanded not to open Jannah until you come. Then he opens Jannah. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the one who opens it. And then he intercedes sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for people to get out of Jahannam. So multiple intercessions for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you see that honor happening on that day of judgment. So they will see that. But we also need to see his honor in this life before the day of judgment because we need to believe in him and to honor him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now. So the more that you know of his message, the more, the more that you know of the nobility of his message, that he didn't call for the glorification of a tribe, not for the glorification of, uh, of himself, okay, but for Allah azza wa jal. And he was worried about you. You know, so the one, one of the incidents where the Prophet ﷺ was uh, praying at night and he got to cry so much, right, that he wet his beard and he wet his clothes and he wet, you know, the, the ground underneath him. And so Allah sends Jibreel to Muhammad ﷺ and he says, ask him, and Allah knows, and he says, ask him, what is making you cry? And so Jibreel asks Muhammad, what is it making you cry? He says, I'm worried about my ummah. What will happen to them? And if you want to think about it, think about your children. How you would be worried about your children so much that that could keep you up. What will happen to, to them after I die? Will they be okay? Will they have enough food? Will they have this and that? The Prophet wasallam, as he said in the hadith, it's not poverty that I'm worried about when it comes to my ummah. It's having too much dunya. It's it corrupting them. Taking them away from Allah. So he was so worried. He was crying so much. Jibreel asked, received the answer from the Prophet. Goes to Allah. And then Allah says, go back to Muhammad and tell him, فَإِنَّا سَنُرْضِيكَ فِي أُمَّتِكَ وَلَا نَسُوءُكَ We'll satisfy you and please you when it comes to your ummah and not upset you. So, Look at that beautiful relationship between Allah Azza wa Jal and His beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because He sees him crying. He says, why is it that you're crying? He says, I'm worried about my ummah. He said, we're not going to displease you when it comes to your ummah. We'll take care of them because of you. So that is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. And that, again, the nobility of the message testifies the fact that it is from Allah Azza wa Jal. Because, as we said, if it were to come from the shaitan, it would look very different. Right? Allah, the shaitan would not command any of that. And something also to keep in mind, as another testimony that the Prophet ﷺ is a prophet of Allah. So if you believe that there is God, okay? So we're talking to someone who believes in God. And someone rises and he says, I'm speaking on behalf of God. And God told me to do this and this and this and not to do this and this and that. And he spreads this message. And you see this person winning, not losing. Gaining followers, not losing them. Gaining grounds, not losing them. And Allah moves them from one victory to the other, from one victory to the other. Until he establishes control on this earth. And then when he dies... His followers spread his message and carry the same message that he held, live like he lived. And they expand east and they expand west. And they go from one success to the other. Can you claim or can you believe that a wise God who sees someone on earth speaking on his behalf and saying, God told me to do this and not, not that, would support a liar like this and let him win and give him support? Or would he disgrace him? He would disgrace him because if Allah is wise and Allah is, if God is wise and God is, would he let somebody lie about him and not punish him? Like, okay, are, are you going to be wiser than Allah Azza wa Impossible. If you see someone lying about you and using your name to do people and trick them, what would you do? If you are a good person, what would you do? You'd expose him. You're with me? You wouldn't let that happen. Like somebody is 
tricking people, swindling people, stealing their money in your name. Would you let that happen? How could you let that uh, tragedy continue? You would go, you would stop him, you would make sure that he does not speak on your behalf. And if you can have him arrested, you'll have him arrested. Because you will not allow that crime to continue because it goes against your good nature to let somebody use your name like that. Allah Azza wa would let someone lie about him, use his name, and not punish him. In fact, support him. That's why a way that you would know a prophet from a non-prophet is how they live and how they end. And what happens to their message. If they are lying about Allah, they will be disgraced before they die. And Allah does not support them. And they will not get victory on this earth and good mention on this earth. And the content of the message itself exposes its contradictions. Whereas when it comes from Allah Azza wa Jal, as it happened with whom? Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh was alone. Did he win or not? He won. Allah sent a flood and he won. Ibrahim alayhi salam. He stood up and he told them that your idols are false. They threw him in the fire. Did he burn? No. He won. Musa alayhi salam. Did he win or not? Alone against Pharaoh. They had no physical power to defeat Pharaoh. Did he win or not? He won. Isa alayhi salam, they plotted against him. They couldn't kill him. All of these things tell you that if a person is a prophet of Allah, there is no way to get to him. Especially when that message is a message with a book. A book that, that, that is supposed to persist and teach. There is no way to him. And Allah will support him. Whereas think of the imposters that came after the Prophet wasallam, like Musaylama. Musaylama was what? He claimed, I believe in Muhammad wasallam, Right? He says, I believe in Muhammad wasallam, But I'm also a prophet. What happened to him? He was killed. And then the content of his message was ridiculous. Right? That it was clear to people that what he was saying is false. But those who followed him, followed him because of tribal allegiance. He's from the tribe. So he's, he's one of them. So okay, we'll, 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 we'll be with you. But he got, when he was exposed, that's it. He got abandoned and he got killed. That's the end of a pastor. And it wasn't just one. There were a couple of others. And they got defeated as well. Either killed and defeated or defeated. So that's the sign of a person who's lying about Allah Azza wa And if you just look at the history of, uh, of, so, of the so-called modern cults uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, of those who claims a person rises, very charismatic, um, believes, okay, I'm receiving messages from God. He has followers and they go into a compound or they go into uh, uh, a remote land and see what happens at the end how they commit suicide or something uh, ter uh, terribly uh, is discovered about them and they get exposed and disgraced. It can't be that you claim to speak on behalf of Allah and Allah will let that happen. You must be exposed. So Prophet ﷺ went from success to success. And by the time he died وسلم, all of Arabia was Muslim. And then also a testament that he was a prophet teaching, uh, having teachings from Allah, is how his companions lived, which is a reflection of what he taught. How did Abu Bakr live? Like he lived, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He shunned the dunya and lived for the akhirah, and Islam expanded. How did Umar live? Again, shunned the dunya, lived for the akhirah. Islam continued to expand. Uthman, pretty much the same. Ali ibn Abi Talib, the same. Even when we come to Banu Umayyah, who did not live exactly like the Prophet وسلم, but you had enough tabi'een and tabi'i tabi'een that Islam continued to expand. And even when you go to the Abbasid, with all of our mistakes, still Islam continued to expand. So where did that come from? That's an extension of that dose of Iman and Barakah that comes from Muhammad وسلم, that lasted till that time. And probably, inshallah, the last thing I will mention, and then you can ask your questions, just that this hadith, 
where he said sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says my example and the example of the prophets is like an example of a one who built a house and people would go and take a tour of that house and they will say what a beautiful house this is except that there's a missing piece they say it's beautiful except for this missing piece it's incomplete and he says i am that missing piece that missing brick what he means by that sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that the messages of all the prophets before him from adam to ibrahim to musa to isa alayhim as-salatu wassalam ajma'in that is the beautiful house so if someone looks at the message of ibrahim ismail and all of that uh, what what does he see beauty right Beauty in terms of manners, beauty in terms of sharia, beauty in terms of worship, beauty in terms of uh, family life, in terms of financial life, beauty. But then he will say also, but there's something missing. Ah, there's something missing. Because all of that sharia wasn't meant to be lasting. It's for a specific people to a specific time. So there's something in it that is missing. You say... Beautiful, but eh, there's that peace that's missing. Peace that is missing. So Muhammad says, I brought the fulfillment and the completion of that house. So it doesn't mean, of course, that that house was there when the Prophet came. No, actually, it was forgotten. The messages of the prophets were forgotten, right? But the Prophet renewed it. He says, this is what the, all of them have said. That's the beauty, and I'm completing it now. Now this message can last. Now this message is complete and perfect, if you would just apply it. So the message of Muhammad sallallahu why does it supersede, cancel the previous messages, meaning in terms of the sharia, otherwise the basics are all the same. The basics are all the same. But why does it supersede? Because it is lasting, and it's suitable for everybody till the end of time. Whereas the other messages had things in them that weren't. So some of the previous messages, there's more hardship in them. There's more punitive measures in them. But the message of Muhammad ﷺ was a merciful message, was an easy message. Hanifiyatun samha, easy going, easy to follow. So that's the excellence of what the Prophet ﷺ brought and that is his message. And in signaling that I'm completing this message, is to say also that when you examine what, I'm, what I said and what I taught and how I lived, what I'm calling to, and you examine the prophets of Allah, you will find that we're all the same. As if you were to believe in Musa alayhi salam and examine Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you'll find that they're the same. There's no contradiction between them in what they've said. You examine Isa alayhi salam, the true message of Isa and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, they're the same. They're all saying the same thing. قُلْ مَا كُنْتُ بِدَعًا مِّنَ الرُّسُلِ like it's not an, I'm not an unusual prophet. I'm actually a prophet like the other prophets before me. And that confirms it. So that if you believe in Musa alayhi salam, you got to believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Because the reasons to believe in Muhammad وسلم, are greater and stronger than those for Musa. And if you believe in Isa alayhi salam, you have to believe in Muhammad وسلم, because the reasons to believe in him are stronger than Isa. And so he is وسلم, the culmination and the end of all prophets and there is no other prophet behind him. As for their accusations about the Prophet وسلم, these are accusations that are out of context. Because if you were to say about him وسلم, that he is violent, you wouldn't know anything about him. And if you were to say that Prophet وسلم, is violent, you would not have studied his legacy and his life. And let's just address that, inshallah, and then allow just time to, to, uh, for your questions. The Prophet وسلم, lived how many years in Mecca? 13. Did they fight anybody? Did they, you know, carry arms? No. They were being persecuted, tortured. And in fact, Muslims would come to the Prophet ﷺ and they would say, shall we not carry arms? What would he say? He says, I wasn't commanded to do this. That's not for us. For 13 years, they did nothing except 
be patient. And if they had to migrate, they migrated to Africa, some. The rest stayed in Mecca. They didn't do anything. When they go to um, Medina, was it really characterized by conflict, if you think about it? How many times did he fight Quraysh? Actual physical fighting with Quraysh. The main ones is Badr and Uhud. Al-Ahzab, the ditch, right? There was no fighting. They just laid siege to Medina and they stopped. Afterwards, there was no fighting with Quraysh. The opening of Mecca was peaceful. Where is the killing that the Prophet ﷺ did? It's mostly he was وسلم, he was responding to their attacks. They would go after, they would want to harm, and he had to repel their harm. So where is that history of violence? And when people accepted Islam, first at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, most people when they accepted Islam, did they accept Islam because of conflict or at peacetime? It's at peacetime. Because that's what the Sahaba said. When there was treaty between them and the Meccans, and there was cessation of hostilities, meaning no one is going to fight. That's it, a peace treaty. He says, at that time, people had an opportunity to talk to each other and listen to the message. And most people came in droves to Islam at that time. No conflict. But what needed to happen is what? Muslims had to be a power to be contended with. And when you're powerful... You don't have to punish, you don't have to compel. But when you're powerful, people take note of you. Right? right? And when they do that, they say, okay, I'm willing to listen. So they weren't compelled. So most of people who came to Islam, not most, all of them who came to Islam, they came without being compelled. And most of them came after that peace treaty. And later on, during the time of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and so on, historically, People, okay, who their lands were conquered, were never compelled to accept Islam. I actually, historically, because some academics, they noted that when you look at how long it took to convert some populations, they say it took a while for the population to convert, to become Muslim. It says if they were compelled, they would all be Muslim immediately or within a generation. But it took for some populations a time for them to accept Islam. Meaning that they were left. This is what you believe, this is what you believe. Right? And then they came to accept Islam when they understood it. So, attributing um, violence to the Prophet ﷺ or Muslims is ahistorical. Meaning it's not historically accurate. So Allah, let me stop here because I know that I probably should have taken more time than I should. Uh, but let me see, inshallah, if you have just a couple of quick questions, inshallah. I know I'm kind of cramping you into five minutes or so, but inshallah, if there's anything you want to ask, let me know, inshallah. Uh, first note, uh, when you mentioned Abdullah ibn Abdullah, you mentioned that he was the first to come Right. Khadija, I'm sorry. Yes. 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 So of course, I mean, the people in Mecca they believed in Allah Azza wa Jal, but there were flaws in their belief. So some people had a right belief. So they knew about Allah Azza wa Jal and they knew about His wisdom and mercy and all of that. But they could be missing some important points about uh, attributes of Allah, about the Day of Judgment, about this and that. So some had more accurate beliefs, other people had more flawed beliefs about Allah Azza wa Jal. So obviously they didn't receive a message for so long. So the beliefs are not going to all be the same and they're not all going to be accurate in all aspects. But yes, Khadija radiallahu anha and others also knew enough about Allah Azza wa Jal to know certain things about him that were absolutely accurate as we mentioned and as you've mentioned that how Allah treats you is based on how you treat people. Yeah. 
The fitra, fitra was there. That that part wasn't corrupted. Naam, jazakumullah khair. Naam, tafadl. Okay, so the, your question is that we are supposed to uh, consider the Prophet our model and live our life based on his example. Uh, in this modern world, how do we know that we have done enough, right, of the Prophet Wasallam? What we say, inshallah, I mean, I know that some certain points could be confusing. And for those certain points, you would need to ask explicitly about them. So the Prophet did this, do I do this or not? So these points need to be addressed specifically. But in general, we say that um, we imitate the Prophet ﷺ or we treat, try to be as, uh, as much as we can uh, to approximate his example ﷺ to the best of our ability. There are certain things that we'll not be able to do ever, his piety, his righteousness to Allah Azza wa Jal, but they always remain as a source of inspiration that you could push yourself even more and more. But in certain points where we are not sure of what to do and how to do it, then we would need more explicit guidance. So do I fast exactly like he fasted, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? In certain ways, yes. In other minor ways, he used to do things that are extra, that would be beyond us uh, physically. So we need to discuss those in detail, inshallah, for that to be clear, inshallah. Um, so if there's anything... No, I think we're good, right? طيب جزاكم الله خيرا. I hope that that was beneficial. And if you have any questions or concerns or uh, comments, إن شاء الله, you can uh, share that with me later. سبحانك اللهم بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك الحمد لله رب العالمين.